Goldman Sachs just landed in the crosshairs of the Senate Banking Committee. <clears throat> Less than five months ago, Goldman Sachs and its Malaysian subsidiary were criminally charged by the U.S. Department of Justice for a sweeping international corruption scheme conspiring to avail itself of more than $1.6 billion in bribes to multiple high-level government officials across several countries so that the company could reap hundreds of millions of dollars in fees. The case has become infamously known as the 1MDB scandal, named after the Ma Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund that was ripped off. Goldman Sachs admitted to the charges and paid a criminal penalty and disgorgement of over $2.9 billion to settle the charges with the Department of Justice. This sum was on top of the $2.5 billion in cash it paid to settle with the government of Malaysia. Stripping shareholders of $5.4 billion of their capital for criminal conduct in the midst of the worst pandemic in a century might have humbled a lesser institution and encouraged its chairman and CEO, David Solomon, to stay out of the spotlight. Unfortunately for Solomon, however, Goldman Sachs had just come out, come into the crosshairs of the Senate Sher Sher Senator Sherrod Brown, chair of the Senate Banking Committee, and his feisty colleague on that committee, Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren. The senator sent Solomon a letter on Friday demanding answers to a series of questions surrounding Goldman's decision to take advantage of a temporary weakened capital requirement by federal regulators that was sold to the public as allowing banks to continue to make loans to businesses during the pandemic without being hamstrung by capital restraints. The senator wanted to know, among numerous other concerns, if Goldman had received a waiver from regulators to continue its dividend distributions to shareholders, in other words, depleting its capital. Throughout the pandemic, while also availing itself of the weakened capital role, Goldman paid 1.25 per share as a cash dividend each quarter throughout 2020. That's $1.25. Its next, it, its next declared dividend payment in the same amount is scheduled to payment on uh, March 30th. According to Goldman's most recent SEC filing, it had uh, 345,794,361 common shares outstanding as of February 5th, 2021, using five quarterly dividends of $1.25 per share. By March 30th of this year, it will have paid out approximately $2.16 two dollars and sixteen a uh, two point one six billion in cash to shareholders since its March 30th dividend uh, payment in 2020 um, add that 2.16 billion to the 500 uh, 5.4 billion <coughs> that Goldman paid to settle claims related to its 1m DB bribery scandal and we reached a sum of 7.56 billion that has gone poof from Goldman Capital since last March. S&P Global reported on January 19th that Goldman's CFO, Stephen Scher, announced on an earnings uh, call with anal analysis, analysts on that date that Goldman planned to buy back approximately $1.9 billion of its stock in the first quarter of 2021. Since there's only 15 days left in this quarter, one might assume most of that money has been spent. The capital role is question. In, in question is the Supplementary Leverage Ratio, SLR, which impacts only the largest banks and requires that they have uh, capital equal to 3% of their total on-balance sheet assets and off-balance sheet exposures. The weekend will allow the bank to exclude holdings of U.S. Treasury securities and their deposits at the Federal Reserve Banks from their calculation of the SLR. The temporary rule was set to expire on March 31st, but lobbyists for the for the biggest Wall Street banks have been lobbying to have the rule extended. The senators indicate in the letter that they are singling out Goldman Sachs for this reason. To our knowledge, Goldman Bank is the only depository institution that opted into these weakened capital requirements whose holding company continued to reduce its capital by paying dividends. We believe your organization has a unique perspective with regard to these rules. There must be some type of subtlety that we are missing on the words opted into because two other Wall Street mega banks, which, like Goldman, have massive off balance sheet exposure to derivatives, also took advantage of the weakened rule and continue to pay out their regular cash dividends through 2020. Those mega banks are Citigroup and JP Morgan Chase. Citigroup reported the following in its most recent 10K filing with the SEC. 
Temporary Supplementary Leverage Ratio, SLR, relief for bank holding companies co commencing in the second quarter of 2020, allowing Citigroup to temporarily expand its balance sheet by excluding U.S. Treasury securities and deposits with FRB from the SLR denominator. Citigroup's reported supplementary leverage ra ratio of 7% benefited by 109 basis points during the fourth quarter of 2020 as a result of the temporary relief. Excluding the temporary relief, Citigroup's supplementary leverage ratio would have been 5.91. <clears throat> JP Morgan Chase wrote this in the most recent 10K filing with SEC. The firm's SLR was 6.9%. The SLR reflects the temporary exclusions of U.S. Treasury securities and deposits at Federal Reserve banks as required by the Federal Reserve's interim final rule issued on April 1, 2020. The firm's SLR excluding the temporary relief was 5.8%. According to the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency's most recent quarterly report on derivatives for the quarter ending September 30, 2020, the federally insured banking units of J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman, and Citigroup's Citibank held the following amounts of notional derivatives face amount uh, $5.6 trillion, $45.4 trillion, and $42.2 trillion, respectively. The number, however, that is a screaming red flag for Goldman's federally insured bank known as Goldman Sachs Bank USA is that it, its credit exposure to its capital stands at 304%. See the chart below. OCC data as of September 30th, 2020. Data in millions of dollars. J.P. Morgan Chase <coughs> Bank in a North America Total assets, 2869536 Total derivatives, 50636122 Total credit exposure to capital, 168%. Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Total assets, $277,943. Uh, no, $277, uh, total derivatives, 45439122 Total credit exposure to capital, 304. Citibank National, uh, ASSM. Total assets, 1,648,667. Total derivatives, 42,242,816. Total credit exposure to capital, 135%. Bank of America, North America, NA. Uh, total assets, $2,157,008. Total derivatives, $17,497,270. Total credit exposure to capital, uh, 54%. Wells Fargo Bank, NA, North America, I think. Total assets, $1,750,196. Total derivatives, $11,625,300. Total credit exposure to capital, 30%. The, the following financial crack. Following the financial crash of 2008, Phil Engelides, the chair of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, FCIC, had this to say on June 30, 2010, at a hearing convened specifically to examine the role of the derivatives in the financial crisis. I must say that despite 30 years in housing, finance, and investment in both the public and private sectors, I had little appreciation of the tremendous leverage, risk, and speculation that was growing in the dark world of derivatives. Neither, apparently, did the captains of finance nor our leaders in Washington. The sheer size of the derivatives market is as stunning as its growth. The notional value of the over-the-counter derivatives grew from $88 trillion in 1999 to $684 trillion in 2008. That's more than 10 times the size of the gross domestic, pro domestic products of all nations. Credit derivatives grew from less than a trillion dollars at the beginning of this decade to a peak of $58 trillion in 2007. These derivatives multiplied throughout our financial markets, unseen and unregulated. In, in June 2008, Goldman, uh, Gold, Goldman's derivative book had a stunning notion value of $53 trillion. End quote. Well, guess what? <coughs> Goldman's... In derivatives book almost 13 years and two financial crises later still stands at 45.4 trillion and it is highly likely that it's the counterparties that are on the other side of those derivative trades that are concerning senators brown and warren 
For a peek at what Goldman's counterparty exposure might look like today, below is a graph released by the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission after the 2008 crash. If this chart suggests the likelihood of systematic contagion in the next financial crisis, you're thinking along the right lines. On top of these concerns, there is also this. Uh, this is this an article link for, for the site Wall Street on Parade. Wall Street banks are dangerously evading U.S. derivatives rules by making trading trades at foreign subsidiaries. Uh, this is not the first time the Senators uh, Brown and Warren have expressed concerns about the weakened SLR capital rule. They sent a letter to federal regulators on June 19th last year urging them to reverse this weakened rule, explaining as follows. To the families who were affected by the last financial crisis, capital requirements were not some abstract ratio found in the pages of a federal register. They represented the difference between families and workers losing their homes, jobs, and livelihoods. The same is true as the country faces a new economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. You should reverse this rule and immediately take action to, do, to preserve capital at financial institutions to ensure that these institutions are stable and can provide the needed assistance to their customers and to the economy as a whole.